Greetings and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you begin to like what you are hearing, please join the Back to Ashes family by hitting that subscribe button and also remember to hit that bell icon and set that one to all that way you'll be reminded of every time a video is uploaded. If you are interested in becoming a subscriber, all that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I used to work in the bar business in the local clubs in my local area. So this consisted of cleaning down the bars at 3 a.m. and not getting home until around 4.30 or 5. The thing is, after each shift, I was always so hungry, so I'd make something to eat when I got in, go straight to bed after. The thing is, when I finished in the kitchen, I didn't bother to turn the lights on. I knew my parents' house like the back of my hand. I knew where I was walking, straight through the back room, straight through the front room, into the hallway, up the stairs to bed. When I turned the light off to walk through the back room, mouthful of sandwich, by the way, there was a humming from a girl right next to my ear, as if someone was stood straight right there, singing right into my ear. A young girl, and I felt the breath right on my cheek as she sung this little melody, it made me go ice cold within a second. I have never heard the humming before, or what it could even be that she was humming, ever. But there is no possible remedy as to where this came from. All electricals were off. Everyone was in bed. The dogs were even asleep, and it wasn't windy. I didn't even have my phone on. It was in my pocket. I stopped walking when this happened, went absolutely ice cold, considering what just happened, and then carried on walking. I did not want to make a scene at this time in the morning. Not tonight, spirit. Not after that shift. I still tell people about this occurrence years later. It's been at least six or seven years. There is no possible reason that this happened other than it being a spirit humming in my ear. I remember the feeling of it being like ice-cold breath down my cheek as she sung. It lasted only about three seconds, but I know what it was. I still remember it like it was last night, and then three seconds still absolutely haunts me. I did not believe in any spirituality or anything of the sort, but I bloody do now. Please take my word. This is a true story. I grew up in a haunted house. There was a man who lived across the street from us, and I think he was a psychic. He told us that our whole neighborhood was on some sort of negative vortex that let spirits in. He said that everyone who lived on the street and the surrounding ones would have a tragedy happen to them. My family had death after death. Our next door neighbors had awful luck. Another house directly across from us, not the psychic guy, of course, was always being sold and rebought. Nobody wanted to stay there for some reason. I believe two of the men died of sudden and random heart attacks. Another person burned themselves alive in their garage. Another house in my neighborhood was redoing their basement, and they found satanic writings on the wall and some sort of relics. My house specifically, though, I believe had the most activity, mostly in the basement. 
Lights would go on and off by themselves. Things would slam and break on their own. A picture of Jesus flew across the room by itself and dented our dryer. Our family and friends who stayed over said they would hear somebody saying, Get out. And everybody would see dark figures, including me. I used to hear people call my name when nobody was home or my mom was sleeping. We would always hear loud bangs. It got so bad, we had to have our house blessed. We used to hear scratching all over the walls and random old music. When my grandfather died, me, my mom, and grandma, and my friend said they saw him. My friend said that he was up in the trees. Every year, a bunch of squirrels would jump into our pool and die. There was a lamp in the basement that, if we asked a ghost to turn it on, they would. My aunt and my mom played on a Ouija board when they were younger. I think maybe that's why these things were happening, on top of the whole neighborhood being haunted. We ended up selling our house and moving out. We sometimes check up on the lady who owns the house now. She posts all about how the house is haunted. She also had a lot of tragedies. My mother also babysat for one of the houses in our neighborhood. She said that the little girl woke up in the middle of the night and opened the front door. My mom asked her what she was doing and she said the people in her pillow told her to go open the door. That was the same house where the two men had heart attacks. Ever since I lived in that house, I have felt like I'm sensitive to ghosts. Thank you for listening to my story. This happened when I was around 12. My family and I had traveled to Malaysia to visit relatives who lived in Sarawak. My family is known for their deep spiritual beliefs and rich traditions. Stories of spirits and supernatural encounters were common in our household, passed down through generations. Almost everyone in my family had a tale of an encounter, be it a whisper in the night or a shadow glimpsed in the corner of their eye. Me, being a skeptic at that age, thought these stories were just a way to scare kids into behaving. One of my uncles ran a small money transfer business exchanging foreign currency for Malaysian ringgit. His work often took him to nearby neighboring cities like Cebu or Selangau, and I looked up to him so much that I'd tag along whenever he let me. One night, during a family dinner, my uncle mentioned he needed to meet a business partner in Cebu the following week. He asked if I wanted to come along, and of course I jumped on the chance. A day later, we left for Cebu. If you've ever been, Cebu is beautiful. Even now, I go back just to soak in the atmosphere whenever my mom and I visit Malaysia. Anywho, most of the trip passed in a blur as it just consisted of me following my uncle to different venues and eating as much local food as I could. But eventually, it was time to head home. The drive back started out quiet and peaceful. It was late, and after the excitement of the trip, I was pretty drowsy. You know those car rides where you can feel the hum of the engine and the gentle sway of the car pulling you into sleep? That is exactly what happened to me as I began resting my head on the seatbelt as I slowly closed my eyes to a deep slumber. Until I woke up. There was a sound knocking, sharp, insistent knocks that jolted me awake. I was still in the car, but we were driving along a winding road on a mountainside, the dark trees closing in around us. I glanced at my uncle. His face was tense, and both hands were clenched on the wheel. Normally, he'd have the radio on, humming along to some tune, but now the car was dead silent. I heard the knocks again, this time from the back right window. The sound was too loud and deliberate to be pebbles or branches hitting the glass. I looked back, trying to make sense of it, but 
Before I could fully turn, my uncle's voice cut through the air, cold and stern. Tengok Depan, which means look forward. I froze. He sounded different, like he was barely holding back a tremor. He told me to keep my eyes forward, to look down if I had to, but not to turn around. My stomach twisted. Confusion and fear swirled together as the knocks grew louder, moving from one window to the next, each hit sharper and more insistent, like something was trying to get in. My hands clenched the seat, my body trembling as I felt the urge to turn around, to look, but my uncle's command echoed in my head. Then, as if on cue, the knocking escalated, pounding from every window. The sound became deafening, drowning out even the rev of the engine. My chest tightened and tears started slipping down my cheeks as the car began speeding up the engine roaring louder, trying to outrun whatever was out there. Then, silence. In an instant, the knocking stopped. The only sound left was my uncle's shaky breath and the low rumble of the car. I don't remember much of the rest of that drive. My uncle kept talking, forcing a conversation about school or friends. Anything to distract us from what we had just gone through. But I could see it in his eyes beneath his calm mask. He was just as shaken as I was. Years later, I came back to visit my hometown with my mom. And one night, my uncle finally told me the full story. He explained that the mountain road we'd driven on was known to be haunted. He admitted that while I slept, he had seen something, a flash of black in the rearview mirror, a monk's like a shadow darting across the back seat. And just before I woke up, he'd heard it too, a whisper from somewhere behind us. Tengak Depan. It still gives me chills to this day that the warning never came from him. When I was about eight years old, I lived in a two-bedroom townhouse and shared one room with my younger brother. He was about five, I believe. You should know, my room was connected to the stairs, so when you walk out of my room, to the right was the stairs. In front of my room was a hallway, not too far from my mom's bedroom, and that was the whole second floor of this townhouse. One random night at around 3 a.m., I woke up to the sound of rain droplets outside of the window next to me. Randomly woke up. No reason. I was planning on just going back to sleep until I heard a weird noise outside my bedroom window. It sounded like the sounds of pots and pans would make once they fall on the floor, but constant. At first, I thought it was the neighbors, but that wouldn't make sense because outside my room is just the stairs and then our downstairs. Everyone was asleep at the time, even my brother sleeping next to me. So I have no explanation to why it was specifically pots and pans I heard. Being the curious eight-year-old child that I was, I noticed my bedroom door was sort of cracked open a bit, but I usually keep it cracked, so this wasn't strange. But I could have sworn I saw something outside my room for a split second. So I decided to peek a little closer, expecting nothing. Unfortunately, that isn't what happened. The first thing I saw was a fast white thing moving across the hallway up and down. I didn't know what it was until it fully came into view. It looked exactly like the girl from the ring, so it wasn't just a it. It was what looked like a girl with long black hair and a long white dress. She was on all fours doing that bridge position except crawling in it, and she was extremely fast. 
the speed not even a normal human can make. I was still staring at her through the cracks of my door, but she never actually acknowledged me. Thank God. I also do remember once I saw her, I heard her feet moving and kicking on the floor as she crawled. And honestly, I don't remember what I was feeling or thinking at the time. I don't know if I was truly scared or confused, but I stared at her for a good ten seconds before closing my door and going back to my bed. It never opened the door, only continued to run in the hallway as I still heard her feet hitting the carpet. Eventually, I fell asleep, still hearing the pots and pans noises Then I think she was somehow making and her feet crawling, but soon after that whole incident happened, I acted as if it never actually happened. I never spoke up about it, and I acted completely oblivious to it, like I was trying to bury it in my mind, even though I didn't have another encounter like that, thank God. I stayed in that house for another few months before moving into a new home. It was only until recently, at my birthday party, me and my friends were exchanging scary stuff that happened to us as kids since we were having a really big sleepover. And after not saying anything about it for years, I finally decided to share my story with them. Just like how I am now, sharing this weird experience with you. This happened in August of 2024. I'm not even sure if it counts as a scary story, but for me, it definitely is. Part of why I'm telling you this story is to warn women never to walk home alone at night because you never know who you will run into and what intentions that person has. Let me start by saying I was very lucky that night, despite it all. I spent the evening with some close friends of mine, hanging out at my place at first, drinking some beer and having a good time. Later that evening, we went to a local bar downtown. We drank, danced, laughed, sang karaoke, and basically just had the best night of our lives. It's sad that my memory of that night got sullied by what happened on my way home. The bar closed at 2 a.m., after we had sung the last song for the night with a host of the karaoke. My friend said she could walk me halfway home and then we would part ways at the local high school because we were going in opposite directions there. I was fine with that. I've never been afraid to walk home at night because why would anything ever happen to me? We walked together and at the school, we parted ways like planned. We thanked each other for an amazing night and I walked across the park right outside of the school towards the big entrance where I would turn right. As I got closer to that turn, I noticed someone coming up behind me on a bike. I didn't think much of it, but thought it was strange since he didn't pass me even though he should be a lot faster than me on that bike. I tried calling a friend mostly because I felt social for being drunk and wanted someone to talk to, but he didn't pick up. Just as I was about to turn right by the entrance, the guy behind me parked his bike and ran up to me. He basically jumped in front of me and said, Hi. I got a bit scared at first, but greeted him back. The first thing I noticed was his dark, smooth skin and his big smile. He had a kind of face that looked quite young. He asked for my name and told me his. I was just being friendly and social as I was affected by the alcohol. He didn't seem threatening in any way, but his kind of demeanor, slim body, and that bright smile. I asked him which way he was going, and since he was going the same way, I told him he could keep me company until we had to part. He agreed. He grabbed his bike and walked next to me as he asked how old I was. I said I had just turned 30. He seemed a bit surprised by that and I asked his age and he said 20. 
We small talked a little about what we had done earlier that evening and stuff like that. Eventually, he asked for my number and I refused to give it to him. I said I don't feel comfortable giving my number to strangers, but I could add him on Facebook. He asked me to give him my phone as I opened the app. Then he searched for his name and pressed add friend. After this, he said, you will never write to me though. I promised him I would, and he kept saying I wouldn't. I couldn't help but feel like he was acting a bit pathetic, and he was starting to make me a bit uncomfortable. We had walked together for about 10 minutes or less when we were about to part ways. I was going left and he was going straight. I said, It was really nice to meet you and talk for a bit. Have a very nice night. Then I turned around to walk home. He said, Hey, come on, give me a hug. I was super uncomfortable, but I agreed. One hug, I could manage that. But as I gave him a hug, he grabbed me tight and held me as if we were a couple. I tried to push him away while smiling awkwardly and said, <laughs> Um, I, I have to go. But he grabbed me even tighter and pressed his lips against mine. I pushed him away and told him, I don't want to do this. Uh, I have a boyfriend. He stepped back and looked at the ground with a frown, as if to make me feel sorry for him. Once again, I couldn't help but think he was acting very pathetic. My memory is a bit blurry about how everything went down exactly after this, but I'm pretty sure I said something about going home again before he grabbed me once more. This time, he held one hand behind my back and the other one at the back of my head, forcibly making out with me. I tried to push him away with both hands, but he was surprisingly strong. He begged, Please, kiss me back. Why won't you just kiss me back? I said, Because I don't want to. Like I said, I have a boyfriend, and I just want to go home. Then he said, But I love you. Don't you love me? I started to wonder how this person's brain was wired. I said, No, I love my boyfriend, and I don't even know you. You don't know me either, so you can't love me. He replied that he does know me, and he does love me. He kept making out with my closed mouth forcibly and pushing me against a fence, where he proceeded to fondle me in ways we shouldn't ever do without consent. I just wanted to get away, but he was stronger than me. I wished I would have done more, but for some reason I didn't. I didn't kick him in the nuts or punch him in the face. I just kept trying to push him away or break free from his grip, even though it clearly didn't work. I asked him to stop, and eventually he let go of me. I started walking away from him, but he walked after me. I told him to stop, and he asked if I had a cigarette. He said if I had one smoke with him, then I could go home and he would leave me alone. So I agreed. In my drunken state of mind, I guess I wasn't as scared as I had been if I were sober. He walked up to me, and I told him to keep his distance. He stood close to me still, but at least he wasn't touching me. I lit a cigarette and gave it to him, but he told me he doesn't smoke. I was honestly just annoyed at this point. So I put the cigarette in my mouth and said, Well, I'm going home now. Have a good night. Bye. And then I started walking. He walked behind me and I turned around and said, Stop following me. Just go home. He asked if he could come with me to my place. I almost exploded. How dumb can someone be? I obviously said no and he asked why. I just replied, Because I don't want you at my place. Then he started whining again about how I was going to ignore his messages if he contacted me. I said I promised to reply if he messaged me, 
hoping he would leave me alone if he thought we'd be in contact again. After a while, he ran up to me and begged for one last hug. I said, you have gotten your last hug. Let me go. As I tried to walk past him, he grabbed me again and held me tight and kept trying to make out with me. I tried to run away, but he grabbed me from behind. He forced my head back so that my chin was positioned over his shoulder so he could keep making out with me from behind. At this point, I started begging him to let me go. I could barely breathe as his thick lips and disgusting tongue covered half my face. I repeated, Please, stop! As soon as I got the slightest chance to speak, I eventually kneeled to the ground as a means to escape his grip somehow. But that just put me in an even worse position as he forced me on my back on the cold ground. It was wet as it had been raining during that night. I had dropped my half-smoked cigarette on the ground. I was watching the glow and smoke coming from it as the guy laid with half of his body on top of me. I was done fighting and just accepted my fate. After he's done with me, he will let me go home, I thought myself. After having touched my breasts for a moment, he grabbed the zipper tie to my jacket to open it. But I grabbed my jacket hard by the collar so that he couldn't. Instead, he started touching me down there and kissed my neck passionately. I was in a state of shock and panic. I just remember staring into the bushes, thinking I had no choice but to accept what was happening. He kept an eye on the road all the time, obviously not wanting anyone to see what was going on. There was a roundabout not far from us and many roads for him to keep his eye on. This is where I got lucky. By some miracle at that time, some random car came driving into that roundabout at almost 3 a.m. The guy stood up immediately and dashed towards his bike that he had left where we were first about to part ways. I looked for a second as he ran away before I stood up and dashed in the other direction. I started crying and ran towards the roundabout. The car never saw me. I picked up my phone and called the friend that had followed me halfway home. It took a moment for me to calm down enough for her to even understand what I was saying. On my way home, I told her about the whole situation and she was devastated to hear what had happened. She told me to call the cops as soon as I was inside my apartment, which I did. The case is currently ongoing as I'm writing this. Luckily, I had his name, address, and approximate location to his home, so it didn't take them long to find him. They have him arrested as we speak, and I am waiting for an update as to when the trial will take place. Wish me luck, and please, for the love of God, stay vigilant and be careful out there. For a warning, this story involves child essays, so if you don't want to listen to it, I'm letting you know now. But I'm also shining light on the real world in which this actually does happen. I was 12 when this happened. I'm now 27. I had agreed with my friends to travel to the capital of our country together. My parents were a part of my life somewhat but didn't care where I went or who I was with, as they both were junkies and alcoholics. I worked doing odd jobs since I was nine for money. The day we had planned to leave, though, my friends called me saying they couldn't make it. I was always a bit scared as a kid, but that day I decided to go alone and have a good day. I never had many good days that often. 
I took the train we had planned to that day. Everything was fine. I spoke to a nice lady on one of the seats nearby, so nothing bad so far. After a bit of a chat with the lady, we heard the announcement that we'll arrive in 10 minutes. I needed to pee but didn't want to be in the bathroom in case I didn't get off, so I decided to hold it. I got off the train, busting and ready to wet myself. I saw the station bathrooms and hurried into them. They had a lot of people taking up the urinals, so I decided to make my way to the back where the stalls were. I get to them and start looking into the stalls, as sometimes there's a guy peeing with the door open. While I'm doing that, looking for a stall, I notice an older gentleman doing the same, but I didn't think anything of it. I walked into the stall and let loose. But I remember I didn't shut the door. Thinking I escaped the situation, I decided to press on with my little adventure. Thinking of it now, I wished I had stayed at the station and went home. I made my way to one of the biggest landmarks that was nearby, not thinking to really look around me, but looking around as I was amazed by the city as I walked through it. I came across a park and realized I still needed to finish being, about 20 minutes after leaving the station. I walked to the bathroom and then it dawns on me. I'm starting to freak out about the situation earlier. I peek my head in checking to see if the guy is in there, and after seeing no one, I think I'm going to wait until another man or someone else walks in, so that way I'm not alone. After about five minutes, two guys walk in, and I walk in right after. I stopped at the urinal, so I'm in view of the two men. Starting to freak out more, I realized I can't pee at all. Nothing is coming out, but... I know if I can break the seal, it'll happen again. I started to freak out more, so I leave the bathroom in embarrassment. I wait for someone else to walk in. Luckily, I didn't wait long. This time, I rushed into the stall and closed the door properly before I took a piss. Concentrating on how good I felt to finally go and finishing this time, I shake it off and walk out the stall door to realize I'm not alone, and not with a guy I walked in after. The man was standing between the entrance and the stalls. I started to freak out as he rushed me, frozen in fear, and set the creepy smile knowing all too well what was going to happen. He grabbed me and threw me into the stall, shoving his hand over my mouth. He started to undress me as I cried. He started touching me both with his hands and orally. I banged on the side of the stall door to try and hopefully get someone's attention. And that's when he quickly leaned in next to my ear and whispered, If someone comes in here, I'll fucking kill you. And so I stopped, still frozen in fear. And now, even more so, with the threat of my life. I let him do what he wanted. Eventually, he moved on to him shoving his bits in my mouth. That's when we heard footsteps. Keeping his bits in my mouth, he tells me to shut up. He's looking around to see if he sees someone, and that's when I hear the best words I've ever heard in my life. This is the police. Open the door. Shouting at the top of their lungs. They were angry. The man is assumed feeling defeated, pulling his bits out, and I start crying loudly. He opens the door, and one cop arrests him. The look on their faces as they realized it was a child in the stall made me feel like someone actually cared for me for once. The man was arrested and taken to prison. I hope he never gets out. But since that day, I haven't spoken to anyone about it but my parents and the police that day. My parents didn't believe me, and I no longer live or have contact with them. 
Even to this day, I can't use a public bathroom unless it's in a stall and that door is closed. But now I can look after myself more than I could back then. To the dude who forced himself on me that day, I really wish the death penalty was still around for you and people like you. I have left a fair bit out because... As I wrote this, I started to shake and have a panic attack, but also before I either forget. Thank you to the two officers who were there for me and saved my life that day. To any grown men and women, please make sure to keep your eyes peeled in places such as public bathrooms. You never know what is going on behind that closed stall door. This happened about 15 years ago, but my sister and I still talk about it sometimes. I was 16 and my sister was 18. We lived in a single parent household, so my mom worked a lot to keep us afloat. So we were used to being on our own pretty often. We lived in a small city on the edge of town. The houses on our street were quite spaced out, separated by several trees, etc., our driveway was long and curved as it got closer to the house, which meant the view of the street and neighboring houses were obstructed from the front windows. Our front yard was large with multiple big trees, providing a lot of privacy and further obstruction. Maybe too much. My mom had decided to go on a week-long trip to stay with her aunt on the coast, so it was just me and my sister. The first two or three days were uneventful. I went to school, my sister went to work. We came home and mostly spent the evening fighting over who was going to use the computer. We were poor and only had one computer with good old dial-up. The following night, though, something strange happened. Just as the sun was setting and it was beginning to get dark, I was in the lounge room while my sister was on the computer in the office when I heard a car slowly coming up the driveway. At first, I thought it was my mom coming home early, which I admit disappointed me for a moment. But it didn't sound like her car. I was able to get a great view of the car from where I was sitting on the couch through the window, but I didn't recognize it. It was old, dirty, and faded, and I couldn't make out the driver through the windows. I waited, watching as the car pulled up to a stop just outside the house. After a minute, a man slowly stepped out of the driver's side door. He looked on the older side, maybe 50s, although I was young and everyone looked old back then. He stood by his car for a few moments, looking up at the house, and then slowly made his way up the veranda and towards the front door. By now, I was feeling uneasy. I definitely didn't recognize this man, and my mom wasn't home. I felt almost frozen. I didn't know if my sister was aware of this happening, and in that moment, I didn't want to yell out to her to make myself known to this man. I just stood there, not knowing what to do. He got to the door and knocked. I tiptoed to the office to get my sister, who looked equally as uneasy. We just stood there in the hallway, eyes staring at the door, neither of us wanting to answer. Even though I'm the youngest, my sister was quite reserved compared to me. So, after a few moments, I worked up the courage to open the door. Just a crack. Luckily, we had a chain, so I made sure to fasten it before I opened the door and said, Can I help you? The man at the door smiled, although something told me it wasn't a genuine smile, like it didn't affect his eyes. Hi there, he said. I'm just here to check up on the place. Your mom asked if I could do her a favor and stop by, make sure everything was all right while she's away. 
At that age, I was pretty naive and trusting, but something about this guy was just off. Whether it was his voice, the way he looked, how he moved so slowly, but what really didn't sit right with me is that we had spoken to my mom that morning. She didn't mention anyone coming by to check up on us, and she's the overly protective type, telling us everything twice, asking several times if this or that is okay, water her garden, keep the doors locked, etc. And she definitely made no mention of this. My heart sank. I looked back at my sister, who was hiding a few steps behind me, frozen. Um... Maybe you have the wrong house? I said, my voice clearly shaking. My mind was racing, trying to work out what was going on, why he was there and what he really wanted. But the man didn't budge. Instead, he kept the same unconvincing smile, eyes transfixed on me. My heart was racing. No mistake, he replied, rather calmly, his voice almost too confident. Your mom told me you'd be here. Just wanted someone to keep an eye on things. His eyes moved from mine to over my shoulder. His gaze lingered a bit too long on the side of the house, as though he was mapping it out. It's nothing to worry about. Do you mind if I come in just for a quick look? Everything inside me was screaming to slam the door. But I was terrified of angering him, scared of what he might do if provoked. I knew this wasn't someone friendly, like one of the neighbors. I knew all of my neighbors somewhat, or at least knew what they looked like. It was more of the way he held himself, so calm, as if he knew he'd get his way. I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. My thoughts weren't clear. I couldn't envision an escape plan. Somehow I gained the nerve to shake my head, trying to sound polite yet firm at the same time. Uh, no, sorry. I think you should leave. The man's smile faded somewhat. After a pause, he lifted his hand that was held in the crack of the open door. He took a step back. I started to close the door, but before I could, he looked me dead in the eye and said, Are you sure about that? The way he said it, so casual, so eerie, made my skin crawl. I managed to close the door, but my hands were shaking like crazy. I had no idea how I managed to do it. My sister and I stood there in silence frozen, listening, waiting, until we finally heard footsteps departing, foot by foot, going down the front steps and a car engine start up. For what felt like a lifetime, my sister and I were just standing there in the doorway, unable to speak or move. Silence. His words, behavior, and nonverbals were ruminating in our head. That strange tone, like he was just daring me to let him in. Like he could easily convince me. The overconfidence. I couldn't shake the feeling that he'd come here for something specific. And we'd somehow nearly escaped some plan. When we were finally able to move ever so quietly, as if he'd come back, if he heard us, we made our way around the house, making sure all the doors and windows were locked. I still didn't feel safe, and I barely slept, in my sister's room of course, until my mom returned. We never saw the man again, but to this day, the event still gives me nightmares. What troubles me the most is that the man knew my mom was away, knew she was gone for an extended period even, knew we'd be at home, knew where we lived. 
How? I've never been able to answer that question, and it still haunts me. Whoever you were, man, at the door to my house, let's not ever meet again. This happened a couple of years ago. In the month leading up to what I want to share with you all, there's some things that you need to know. Strange things were happening around our three-story house. It wasn't just me who noticed. My whole family had been experiencing unsettling occurrences. One night at around 3 a.m., my uncle stepped outside to throw out the trash. We're night owls, so someone being up at that hour wasn't unusual. But as he stood in the cold darkness, he felt it, that prickling sensation of being watched. In front of him loomed my mom's van, but the shadows around it were dense, and he couldn't make out any details. He shook off the feeling, blaming it on the late hour, but that was just the beginning. Not long after, my mom started finding things out of place in her car. Objects that had been moved or gone missing. Once, she found a beer bottle she knew didn't belong there. She had always kept her car unlocked, trusting that the neighborhood was safe. But after that, she started locking it, just in case. As for me, I stayed on the third floor. My room had a window facing the front of the house, and at night, I would hear odd things. Faint footsteps creaking on the stairs leading to the front door. Those stairs always groaned when someone walked on them, so you could never mistake that sound. It wasn't too alarming since one of my uncles often came home at weird hours after a night out. But something about the way the steps creaked felt different. One night, after watching a horror movie, I decided to sleep in my grandma's room. I wasn't in the mood to sleep alone. I made a little tent on the floor, but I couldn't settle down. My grandma's room had a monitor for the security cameras, and the screen was showing the driveway. It was close to midnight when I saw him a tall man lurking near the edge of the camera's view. He was just standing there. I hoped I was just imagining things, but no matter how hard I blinked, he didn't disappear. I quickly checked our family group chat to see if anyone else had just arrived, as late-night arrivals weren't uncommon in our house. But everyone said they were still out or in their rooms. I glanced back at the monitor. He was gone. The empty driveway stared back at me, and I couldn't shake the dread that settled in. Now for the day, everything escalated. About a month later, I was home alone. I didn't go to school that day, and everyone else was at work or class. It was a quiet afternoon at around 2 p.m., and I was just scrolling through TikTok, not expecting anything unusual. Then, I heard it. A man's voice and the faint hum of a car engine. At first, I wasn't scared. It was broad daylight. But, curiosity made me get up and look out the window. There, parked in our driveway, was a golf cart, and a man in a blue shirt stood beside it. He wasn't tall, but he didn't look friendly. Something about him just didn't feel right. Why was he there? My family's cars were gone, and no one was supposed to be home. The longer I watched, the more a feeling of unease clawed at me. I called my mom, who was working at the hospital, but she didn't pick up. I dialed my stepfather next, asking if... Someone was supposed to be coming over. When he said no, the dread turned into fear. I told him there was a strange man in our driveway. He told me to keep him updated, and not long after, my mom called back, 
telling me to call the police immediately and then call her back. The dispatcher told me to hide, but before I did, I needed to check the doors. I didn't know if anyone had locked them before leaving. I rushed downstairs and found the front door locked, but when I got to the back door, my stomach dropped. It was wide open. I hurriedly slammed it shut and locked it, but just as I turned to head back upstairs, I heard it. A sharp, desperate rattle of the doorknob. Someone was trying to get in. I glanced back and saw him. A tall figure, much like the man I had seen on the camera a week before. He was pulling at the door, as though he knew I had just locked him out. I bolted up the stairs, heart pounding, and locked myself in my parents' room, my hands trembling as I spoke to the 911 operator. The minutes felt like hours, the silence in the house suffocating as I waited for the police to arrive. When they finally came, they searched the house and the property, but found no one. No signs of the man in the blue shirt or the tall man at the back door. It was as if they had never seen them before. The police reviewed the footage, but it didn't show anything conclusive. No clear images. No answers. Just shadows where they shouldn't be. To this day, I have so many questions. Who were those men? Were they working together? Or was it some horrible coincidence? The lack of answers haunts me. Since then, my family and I always double-check the locks on our doors and cars. But I can't help but wonder, what if I hadn't locked the back door in time? The thought sent chills down my spine, even now. And then, just a few weeks ago, I was back in the neighborhood when I saw it again. A golf cart, almost identical to the one from that day, a reminder of the nightmare I thought I had left behind. I'm not planning on digging any deeper. Some things are better left in the dark. But I'll never forget the fear that gripped me that day and how close danger felt just on the other side of the door. Thank you for listening to my story. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Of course, you all know how much gratitude and love I have for each and every one of you for remaining a pillar upon which this channel stands. If I could thank you enough, I would be sitting in this chair forever. <laughs> so thank you so much. For the subscribers, for the new time listeners and the peekaboos, thank you all so much for your support. For without you, I would not have a voice and there would not be a back to ashes. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.